Hello my dear friends. Now as a part of the continuation of the ECG series, in this session I will be discussing the very important form of the cardiac arrhythmia. So I'll just give you a clinical scenario of that particular cardiac arrhythmia and then we will go on to the discussion of that particular cardiac arrhythmias. So we have a chronic alcoholic, he has developed palpitations. Suddenly after an alcohol binge. His pulse is irregularly irregular. Which of the following arrhythmia is most commonly associated with alcohol binge in the alcoholics? The options are the ventricular fibrillation, ventricular premature contractions, atrial flutter and then atrial fibrillation. So please remember the most common form of arrhythmia that is associated with alcohol binge in alcoholics is your atrial fibrillation. So in this session, we will be discussing in detail about the atrial fibrillation. So atrial fibrillation, it is a form of supraventricular arrhythmia. Right? And other forms of supraventricular arrhythmias include the atrial flutter, PSVT that is paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia and as well as the SVT with aberrancy that is supraventricular tachycardia with aberrancy. So these are the various forms of supraventricular arrhythmias and the one which we are discussing now is about the atrial fibrillation. Now whenever the pulse is irregularly irregular the first important differential diagnosis what you need to suspect is your atrial fibrillation. But you have many other conditions where you have irregularly irregular rhythm. But one of the very important differential diagnosis what you need to consider is your atrial fibrillation. So please remember whenever the pulse is irregularly irregular atrial fibrillation is almost always the diagnosis. It is like almost always I did not tell always. You have many other conditions as I have said you that you have this irregularly irregular rhythm. Now an arrhythmia occurring after a drinking binge is known as the holiday heart syndrome. So when will an individual have a binge usually during the holidays. So if this particular arrhythmia occurs after a drinking binge this is known as the holiday heart syndrome. And remember there are three important forms of arrhythmias which known to follow the drinking binge. Those arrhythmias include the atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter and then the ventricular premature contracture out of which the most common type of arrhythmia which follows a alcohol binge is your atrial fibrillation. Now this particular alcohol on the heart it will not only cause the atrial fibrillation the most common cardiac effect of chronic drinking is dilated cardiomyopathy. So please remember this is a very very important point. The most common cardiac effect of chronic drinking is dilated cardiomyopathy. Now let me tell you what exactly are the etiologies which will cause the atrial fibrillation. So you see a multiple choice question here. Atrial fibrillation may occur in all of the following conditions except mitral stenosis, hypothyroidism, dilated cardiomyopathy, mitral regurgitation. Now I will tell you the etiologies of atrial fibrillation in the form of a mnemonic. And what is that particular mnemonic? The mnemonic is atrial fib. The word A stands for alcohol abuse. Right? And not only alcohol abuse, even your excess caffeine can also induce the atrial fibrillation. Then the word T is your thyroid disease. So which form of thyroid disease the individual is more prone for the development of atrial fibrillation? It is mainly, right? It is mainly hyperthyroidism. So in hyperthyroidism, the individual can have the development of the atrial fibrillation. And in hyperthyroidism, you can see all the forms of arrhythmia, but the most common form of arrhythmia will be atrial fibrillation. 
next the word r is your rheumatic heart disease so in which particular clinical scenario of rheumatic heart disease or in which particular valvular pathology of your rheumatic heart disease the individual will develop cardiac arrhythmia is in patients with a mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation so in mitral valve pathologies of your rheumatic heart disease the left atrium is enlarged and this enlarged left atrium will be throwing the abnormal impulses and that will make the individual to land up in the atrial fibrillation and the ischemic heart disease is another important etiology which can cause the atrial fibrillation that is your word i then you take the word a again so this particular a is your tumors of the heart that is atrial myxoma right atrial myxoma and asd atrial septal defect and regarding the atrial myxoma you need to remember one important additional heart sound and that important additional heart sound what you will have in atrial myxoma is the tumor plop and one of the very important peculiar feature of your atrial myxoma is that the presence of orthodeoxia right presence of orthodeoxia what does that mean in atrial myxoma the individual will have difficulty in breathing or dyspnea in sitting posture but once the individual moves towards the supine position the dyspnea will reduce that is what is called as orthodeoxia and that is seen in patients with your atrial myxoma and the word l stands for the lung pathologies that is pulmonary embolism and as well as emphysema you can have this atrial fibrillation and so atrial fib ph stands for pheochromocytoma and let me tell you even you have, what is pheochromocytoma it is the disorder which is characterized by excessive production of catecholamines right excessive production of catecholamines and in pheochromocytoma you will see all the forms of arrhythmias and one of the arrhythmia what you will see in pheochromocytoma is your atrial fibrillation and then fib i stands for idiopathic and the cardiomyopathy and lastly b that is your blood pressure so in patients with hypertension the individual can develop atrial fibrillation see most of the causes like what we see in our day to day practice for an individual to develop atrial fibrillation is your hypertension right so these are all the etiologies which can cause the atrial fibrillation now apart from these etiologies the inflammation of your myocardium and as well as the pericardium that is myocarditis and as well as pericarditis so myocarditis and as well as pericarditis this is another important etiology causing your atrial fibrillation right and apart from that even your hypoxia right apart from that even your hypoxia can also cause this atrial fibrillation okay so these are all the etiologies for your atrial fibrillation and after having discussed okay you see this question now atrial fibrillation may occur in all of the following conditions except the answer is hypothyroidism in hypothyroidism you will not have the atrial fibrillation in hypothyroidism the individual will have bradycardia and what is the other cardiac manifestation in atrial fibrillation the individual can have development of pericardial effusion and the other important cardiac manifestation in hypothyroidism is atrioventricular block and another important the cardiac manifestation in hypothyroidism is diastolic hypertension right so these are the cardiac abnormalities like what you will see in patients with the hypothyroidism whereas in mitral stenosis dilated cardiomyopathy mitral regurgitation there will be development of your atrial fibrillation now let me tell you what exactly is the mechanism of the atrial fibrillation see the mechanism for the development of atrial fibrillation it is an ectopic activity within the atria right or 
because of valvular pathology like for example you take in case of the mitral stenosis what will happen to the left atrium the entire left atrium it gets enlarged and it gets hypertrophied so there will be structural remodeling of your atria the atria it becomes fibrosed or even it becomes dilated so whenever there is structural remodeling within the myocardium of the left atrium there will be also electrical remodeling and this particular electrical remodeling whichever will occur in the myocardium which is abnormal that is responsible for your re-entry phenomenon within the atrial musculature and that re-entry phenomenon whichever starts within the atrial musculature and that is what will make the individual to develop what is called the atrial fibrillation. So please remember now parts of the atrial myocardium that is the clusters of the atrial myocardial cell which are located around the crista terminalis that is the entrance of the coronary sinus and inferior vena cava as well as around the mitral and tricuspid valve they possess the automaticity right they these are all the areas within the atria which has the property of the automaticity in a normal individual they don't conduct right in a normal individual they don't conduct but they have the property of the automaticity so these cells are not conduction cells per se they are actually contractile cells that possess the automaticity and the automaticity of these particular structures like crista terminalis coronary sinus and the cells around the mitral and tricuspid valve the automaticity will be suppressed by the SA nodal cells but in atrial fibrillation all these cells they will start firing the abnormal activity within the atria and wherein the individual will develop what is called atrial fibrillation and why do these cells start abnormal firing that is because of structural remodeling within the heart and what is structural remodeling the fibrosis of the myocardium or dilatation of your the atria and because of this structural remodeling there will be electrical remodeling and then there will be abnormal firing of these particular sites like crista terminalis coronary sinus the areas around the mitral and as well as tricuspid area they start abnormal firing and that will make the individual to land up in what is called atrial fibrillation now you take the types of atrial fibrillation the classification of the atrial fibrillation so the classification of the atrial fibrillation we classify that into the first episode recurrent atrial fibrillation paroxysmal atrial fibrillation persistent long standing persistent atrial fibrillation and permanent atrial fibrillation so these are like the classification of the atrial fibrillation depending upon the duration of the episode of the atrial fibrillation you take the first episode right you take the first episode first episode atrial fibrillation means where the individual will have initial detection of the atrial fibrillation regardless of the symptoms or duration so the individual might be symptomatic or the individual might be asymptomatic but first time diagnosed atrial fibrillation that is your first episode and what will be the symptoms in atrial fibrillation that is mainly palpitations so palpitations will be the very important symptom in patients with the atrial fibrillation then coming to the another important one that is recurrent atrial fibrillation so recurrent atrial fibrillation is that where more than two episodes of atrial fibrillation if it is there right more than two episodes of atrial fibrillation is there then it is called right so recurrent atrial fibrillation is that more than two episodes of atrial fibrillation if it is there that is called recurrent atrial fibrillation then we have another terminology called paroxysmal atrial fibrillation the word paroxysmal means sudden in onset and it is self terminating so a self terminating episode of atrial fibrillation self terminating in the sense it should get self terminated within 7 days that is what is called as paroxysmal atrial fibrillation then we have persistent atrial fibrillation <clears throat> so persistent atrial fibrillation it is not self terminating right and the duration of this particular atrial fibrillation will be more than 7 days that is called persistent atrial fibrillation then followed by that we have long standing persistent atrial fibrillation 
so long standing persistent atrial fibrillation is that where the duration will be for more than one year right where the duration will be for more than one year that is called long standing persistent atrial fibrillation and what do you mean by this word permanent atrial fibrillation permanent atrial fibrillation is also the one the duration of the episode will be for more than one year in which rhythm control interventions are not pursued or not or unsuccessful right whatever the rhythm control interventions you are doing that is anti arrhythmic drugs right they are not successful to revert to the normal sinus rhythm that is what is your permanent atrial fibrillation whereas in long standing persistent atrial fibrillation whenever we use rhythm controlling drugs the rhythm it can get converted into normal sinus rhythm but in permanent atrial fibrillation the rhythm control interventions they are unsuccessful so this is about the types of the atrial fibrillation and in atrial fibrillation what will be the most common symptom that is your palpitations and upon the ap apart from that if you palpate the pulse it will be irregularly irregular pulse right now you take one more question in a patient with chronic atrial fibrillation with a regular beat of with a regular beat of 60 per minute the most probable cause is sleep digitalis toxicity sa nodal block hypothyroidism so usually in atrial fibrillation how will be the beat it is an irregular beat right it will be an irregular beat but here in a patient with chronic atrial fibrillation with a regular beat of 60 per minute that means you need to suspect that the individual is given some treatment to control the rate in atrial fibrillation because in atrial fibrillation the rate will be more than 100 per minute or the ventricular rate it can go even up to 200 per minute the atrial rate will be around 300 400 but your AV node will act as a speed breaker the AV node will not conduct all the impulses whichever have originated from the atria so that is the reason why the ventricular rate can be more than 100 or up to 200 but in our patient here it is a regular beat with 60 per minute that means the individual might be taking an AV nodal blocking agent and what is that AV nodal blocking agent that is digitalis and the individual has developed the digitalis toxicity right the individual has developed the digitalis toxicity so please remember the patient has atrial fibrillation with slow ventricular rhythm <coughs> right the patient has the atrial fibrillation with slow ventricular rhythm and see in atrial fibrillation the rate of generation of impulses in atria will be up to 400 to 600 beats per minute but the ventricular rate is only 60 beats per minute in this particular patient this suggests blockade in the transmission of the atrial impulses to the ventricle and there is an AV block AV nodal block by the digitalis toxicity right now and see if there is an AV nodal block how do you think ventricle will get activated now the ventricles are now activated by a subsidiary ectopic escape pacemaker situated within the AV node below the block or within the ventricle so how will the ventricles be activated now because there is an AV nodal blocking agent that is your digitalis now how will the ventricles get activated the ventricles are now activated by a subsidiary ectopic escape pacemaker which is situated within the AV node below the block or within the ventricle and the atria is activated by one pacemaker that is sinus pacemaker and the ventricles they are activated by another pacemaker which is an idionodal or the idioventricular pacemaker so atria sinus pacemaker ventricle idioventricular pacemaker if there is AV nodal block now 
after having discussed about the clinical scenario, I'll just give you one more clinical scenario. A person with mitral regurgitation and atrial fibrillation presents with syncopal attack. <clears throat> On examination, the person has a heart rate of 55 beats per minute. What is the most probable cause? The options are digitalis toxicity, incomplete heart block, stroke, subarachnoid hemorrhage. So even if you see this particular scenario also, it is similar to that of your previous scenario. A patient with atrial fibrillation with reduced ventricular rate, always you need to suspect digitalis toxicity. Right? Always you need to suspect digitalis toxicity. Right? After having discussed about the features of digitalis toxicity, what is that? AV nodal block. Let me tell you what are the other features of the digitalis toxicity. The other features of the digitalis toxicity, please remember the earliest symptom of your digitalis toxicity will be nausea or vomiting and subsequently the individual can have the yellow vision and subsequently if you take in digitalis toxicity, you can see all the types of arrhythmias. Right, you can have all the types of arrhythmias except atrial fibrillation and Mobitz type 2 AV block. Right, so these are the arrhythmias that you will not see in patients with the digitalis toxicity except for that you will have all the arrhythmias in digitalis toxicity we have one more terminology called digoxin effect so how will you tell that there is a digoxin effect in the ecg that is based on right that is based on the st segment changes and what is that st segment changes you will have in digoxin effect is you will have st depression and this particular ST depression will be in the form of an inverted tick sign. Right, this will be in the form of inverted tick sign. So, this is your inverted tick. Right, so you can see that here, inverted tick. And this inverted tick, it is in the shape of an inverted moustache. So, that is the reason why it is called <clears throat> Salvador Dali's moustache sign that is what is called digoxin effect digoxin toxicity you will have the AV block and you can have all the types of arrhythmias whereas digoxin effect in the ECG that is on the ST segment depression and that ST segment depression will be in the form of the inverted moustache sign now having discussed about the digitalis effect Toxic. See, remember, digoxin is one of the medication what we give in the treatment of the atrial fibrillation. And why do we give digoxin? Mainly to control the ventricular rate, we give digoxin. And when we should give digoxin and all, I will discuss in the treatment part of your atrial arrhythmias. Now, you see one more question related to your atrial fibrillation. Pulse deficit more than 10 is seen in ventricular premature contraction, atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation ventricular fibrillation. So, remember pulse deficit more than 10 is seen in patients with the atrial fibrillation and now you should know what is pulse deficit. You take in a normal individual, whatever is the heart rate that will be equal to that of your pulse rate. So, whenever the heart contracts and that particular contractility of the heart is transmitted to the pulse. So, heart rate will be equal to that of the pulse rate in a normal individual. Then what is pulse deficit? Pulse deficit, it is difference between the heart rate and as well as pulse rate. Right, difference between the heart rate and as well as pulse rate. That is what is called as the pulse deficit and in the pulse deficit 
heart rate will be more than the pulse rate and in which clinical conditions you will have and how do you measure this pulse deficit see in order to measure the pulse deficit you require two examiners one examiner will be counting the heart rate by auscultating over the heart and another examiner has to calculate the pulse rate so the difference in between heart rate and as well as pulse rate this is what is nothing but your pulse deficit this is what is nothing but your pulse deficit now this particular pulse deficit it can occur in the following scenarios it can occur in very early diastolic ventricular ectopic beat or ventricular premature contracture and some patients with pacemaker they can have this particular pulse deficit and remember in atrial fibrillation the pulse deficit is more than 10 per minute whereas in ventricular ectopic beat the pulse deficit is less than 10 per minute <clears throat> so that is what is your pulse deficit so pulse deficit more than 10 where do you see that you will see that in patients with the atrial fibrillation whereas in ventricular premature contractures also you have the pulse deficit but is but that is less than 10 per minute right but that is less than 10 per minute so this is about the examination findings in patients with the atrial fibrillation symptoms palpitation on examination irregularly irregular pulse and pulse deficit more than 10 per minute now let me tell you the ecg findings in patients with the atrial fibrillation so you see this question here absent p wave is seen in atrial fibrillation par pulmonale mitral stenosis and then copd please remember absent p wave is seen in atrial fibrillation now i will discuss all the ecg features of your the atrial fibrillation remember you take the rate ventricular rate if you see it will be slow or it can be normal or it can be fast right either of this it can be but always atrial rate will be more than the ventricular rate right atrial rate will be more than the ventricular rate that is about the rate and you take the regularity and how much will be that atrial rate it can go up to 400 to 600 per minute and how, how much will be your ventricular rate it can be slow if there is AV block because of your digoxin whenever you are giving it can be normal or it can be fast it can be 100 to 200 per minute also the ventricular rate and what about the regularity it is completely irregular And right it is completely irregular and what about the p wave the p wave it is absent right the p wave is absent right instead they will have a chaotic looking baseline and this particular p wave instead of that you have what is called the fibrillatory wave right instead of that you have what is called the fibrillatory wave and how will be the qrs complexes the qrs complex will be absolutely normal <clears throat> and what about the pr interval it is absent when you don't have the p wave when you don't have the p wave where is the question of your pr interval the pr interval will be absent so please remember now rate ventricular rate it can be slow normal or fast atrial rate will be greater than the ventricular rate regularity regularity it is totally a chaotic rhythm irregularly irregular rhythm the p wave is absent the qrs complex is normal the pr interval is absent i'll just show you an ecg strip of your atrial fibrillation so this is the ecg strip of the atrial fibrillation see you might be thinking that this is a p wave but that is not a p wave it is a fibrillatory wave right and 
what is the mechanism for the origin of your the fibrillatory wave that is due to abnormal atrial contractions you have this particular fibrillatory wave and you take the regularity right it is not at all regular it is irregularly irregular right it is irregularly irregular that is one thing and you don't have the pr interval because you don't have a p wave but the qrs complex will be normal hmm? the qrs complex will be normal okay so the absent p wave is seen in patients with the atrial fibrillation now if the question is asked like what is the most common arrhythmia seen in icu patients the options are like atrial flutter atrial fibrillation psvt and paroxysmal atrial tachycardia the answer will be the atrial fibrillation atrial fibrillation that is the most common form of arrhythmia seen in the icu patients so if you see the next question that is acute rate control of atrial fibrillation is with digoxin amiodarone metoprolol adenosine so now in the further part of the discussion of your atrial fibrillation let me take up the discussion on the treatment of atrial fibrillation so if you take the treatment of atrial fibrillation we classify the treatment into three that is we require rate controlling drugs in the atrial fibrillation then rhythm controlling drugs right and the third important thing is the antiplatelets or anticoagulants right antiplatelets or anticoagulants so these are the things in the treatment of the atrial fibrillation rate control ventricular rate control should be done in atrial fibrillation that is very important and not only that even the atrial rate control rhythm control in atrial fibrillation you have irregularly irregular rhythm so you need to control the rhythm and where the individual has to be or the individual should have the normal sinus rhythm and then antiplatelets and anticoagulants why we should give and when we should give i will tell you now coming to the acute rate control so please remember the acute rate control can be achieved in patients with atrial fibrillation with beta blockers and in those individuals where beta blockers cannot be given in them you need to give the calcium channel blockers and these calcium channel blockers include verapamil and diltiazem so these are the drugs for the acute rate control whereas you take another scenario acute rate control with acute congestive heart failure the drug what you need to give here is digoxin so in a scenario of the acute congestive heart failure with atrial fibrillation the drug of choice will be digoxin and please remember beta blockers are usually avoided when the individual is in a state of decompensated or acute congestive heart failure and you take chronic rate control the chronic rate control is done with the beta blockers or calcium channel blockers or with digoxin and for suppose if all these have failed the individual is refractory to the medical management that is the point when you need to go for catheter ablation right that is the point when you need to go for the catheter ablation so this is about your the rate control in acute state and as well as the chronic state now so if you see this question acute rate control in atrial fibrillation it is with your metoprolol right it is with your metoprolol and you take the other drugs like digoxin should be given if the individual is in a state of congestive heart failure 
Amadarone is a rhythm controlling drug. It is not rate controlling drug. It is rhythm controlling drug. And adenosine, it is the drug of choice in case of paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, but not in a clinical scenario of your atrial fibrillation. Now, having discussed about this, we will move on to the next question. A drug used for maintaining rhythm control in majority of patients in India is metoprolol, amidurone, procainamide, lignocaine. Remember, amidurone, which is a class 3 antiarrhythmic drug, right, which is your class 3 antiarrhythmic drug, it is used for maintaining the rhythm control in majority of the patients in India. Like, in spite of the individual being on amidurone, if there is recurrence, then you need to give another important antiarrhythmic drug that is your abutilide. Right, so on recurrence, you should give the abutilide and you need to repeat the cardioversion if the individual is refractory to medical management. And what should be the energy for the cardioversion has to be given, right? What should be the number of joules that should be given for the cardioversion in atrial fibrillation? See, you see this question, new onset atrial fibrillation producing hypotension, pulmonary edema should be managed with synchronous DC shock of 50 joules, 100 joules, 150 joules, 200 joules. The answer to this particular question is the 200 joules. So please remember, if the individual is having any type of arrhythmia, either you take ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, atrial fibrillation or PSVT, in any of these arrhythmias, if the individual is hemodynamically unstable, like hypotension or the individual is in a state of pulmonary edema, the treatment of choice will be DC shock. And in atrial fibrillation, the energy what you need to give is 200 joules of synchronized DC shock should be given. So, now let me summarize the entire treatment. So, acute rate control with beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. Acute rate control with acute congestive heart failure, digoxin. Chronic rate control is done with the beta blockers or calcium channel blockers or digoxin and if it fails catheter ablation right and amidrone is the one which is used for maintaining rhythm control in majority of the patients in India and new onset atrial fibrillation producing hypotension pulmonary edema that should be managed with synchronized DC shock of the 200 joules okay now you take the next important question what is the true statement regarding the atrial fibrillation, increased thromboembolism, digoxin treatment, anticoagulation is not required, aspirin is given. So among the options given to you, remember in patients with atrial fibrillation, there is increased chance of thromboembolism. Now why do they have increased chance of thromboembolism? So please remember, in case of atrial fibrillation, the atria, it is beating around 400 to 600 beats per minute. So when atria is beating almost like 400 to 600 beats per minute, it will be like flickering of the contractions. So whenever there is a flicker of contraction, there will be stasis of the blood within the atria. And that can predispose to the development of thromboembolism. And digoxin treatment, yes, it can be given in the treatment of the atrial fibrillation. And aspirin, yes, we need to give aspirin also, but there are certain indications. What is that indications? I will tell you. But anticoagulation not required is an incorrect statement. So, two statement in this question is increased thromboembolism, digoxin treatment and aspirin should be given. Anticoagulation not required is an incorrect statement. Okay. Now. In which clinical scenarios we give antiplatelets in patients with atrial fibrillation and in which clinical scenarios we need to give anticoagulation. Please remember that these patients with the atrial fibrillation, they are at risk of development of thrombus and this thrombus can undergo embolism. And this particular embolism can give rise to the embolic stroke. 
right this embolism can give rise to an embolic stroke now what is the scoring system which will tell you that is at increased risk of the cardioembolic stroke and that particular scoring system is nothing but your char2 ds2 vas scoring system based on this particular scoring system we will decide whether to give antiplatelets whether to give anticoagulants or not to give anything that is char2 ds2 vas scoring system stands for c is your congestive heart failure if the patient is in a state of congestive heart failure give a score of 1 point and if the individual is having hypertension give a score of 1 point and if the age of the individual is more than or equal to 75 years then you need to give 2 points and if the individual is diabetic give 1 point and if the individual is having stroke then give 2 points right and vas scoring system if the individual has vascular disease give 1 point age of the individual more than or equal to 65 years give 1 point and if the gender if the individual is female give 1 point so how much will be the total scoring it will be around 9 points if individual has all these parameters now according to your european society guidelines or recommendations if the score is 0 in a patient with atrial fibrillation that means none of these parameters are there in an individual with atrial fibrillation then don't give anything no antiplatelet no anticoagulant or you can just give only aspirin but if the score is 1 right if the score is 1 then you need to give aspirin or the anticoagulant right aspirin or anticoagulant and if the score is more than or equal to 2 then definitely you need to give the oral anticoagulation right definitely you need to give the oral anticoagulation now this particular oral anticoagulation you can give either warfarin or you can give novel oral anticoagulants right you can give novel oral anticoagulants what are these novel oral anticoagulants this novel oral anticoagulants they include dabigatron then rivaroxaban epixaban right so these are your the novel oral anticoagulants but please remember this novel oral anticoagulants they are contraindicated or they are avoided in atrial fibrillation secondary to mitral stenosis so in valvular heart disease causing atrial fibrillation don't give novel oral anticoagulants in these patients if you want to give the oral anticoagulants you can give the warfarin but not this novel oral anticoagulants right now so depending upon the char2 ds2 vas scoring system you need to decide whether to give the anticoagulants whether to give antiplatelets or none of this treatment is required now i said you like three modalities rhythm control rate control and then the anticoagulation or antiplatelet rhythm control with your amiodarone and the individual has recurrence with amiodarone then you give ibutalide then rate control that is with your beta blockers and if beta blockers are contraindicated then you can give calcium channel blockers or if the individual with atrial fibrillation is in a state of congestive heart failure then you can give digoxin right and the anticoagulation or antiplatelet you can give aspirin or the oral anticoagulants should be given right you see a question here which of the following agents should not be used for oral anticoagulation in high risk patients with atrial fibrillation warfarin dabigatron rivaroxaban clopidogrel so please remember the clopidogrel right that is an antiplatelet drug it has less anticoagulant effect right it has less anticoagulant effect compared to that of your warfarin and compared to that of your dabigatron and as well as rivaroxaban 
So that is the reason why clopidogrel is not necessary in this particular patient. Okay. Now, after having discussed about this, first suppose a patient with atrial fibrillation with WPW syndrome, what is the drug of choice? Right, treatment of atrial fibrillation with WPW syndrome. What is WPW syndrome? It is a pre-excitation syndrome. Right, so here the drug of choice is options are adenosine, beta blockers, verapamil and then procainamide. So please remember the answer is procainamide. So in a hemodynamically stable patient with atrial fibrillation with the WPW syndrome, drug of choice will be procainamide. Whereas hemodynamically unstable patient with atrial fibrillation with WPW syndrome, urgent synchronized DC cardioversion is required. So that will be the treatment in atrial fibrillation with WPW syndrome. So these are some of the very important points related to your atrial fibrillation. So you need to know the etiology of atrial fibrillation, ECG manifestations in atrial fibrillation, then what will be the very important examination findings that is irregularly irregular rhythm and as well as pulse deficit, then you need to know how to manage the patients of the atrial fibrillation. So with this, I will wind up this particular session and in my subsequent sessions, I will be discussing the other forms of arrhythmias as well. Thank you very much.